My name is Chase Silva. I work for the International Center for Tropical Agriculture. Uh, I'm also a member of the CGIR research program on climate change, agriculture, and food security, uh, CCAFs. So uh, this is really the third of three events happening here in uh, COP19 and GLF, uh, dealing with national adaptation plans, um, and really centering around a recent publication um, from CCAFs. It's called Planning Climate Adaptation in Agriculture, Metasynthesis of National Adaptation Plans in East and West Africa and South Asia. Um, we've been cleaned out of hard copies of the report over the last few days, so we don't have the hard copies available, but we do have USB sticks up front, um, and you can also grab them from Osana here, um, who's with the markers right now, um, and she can get one of those to you. And it also has additional CCAS publications uh, on it as well. The first event that occurred around uh, national adaptation plans and around um, this new metasynthesis report was a two-day learning workshop where we brought together um, about 37 representatives from 10 different countries um, and tried to look at some lessons learned regarding national adaptation plan development, particularly with regard to the integration of agriculture into the NAP process. Um, that two-day learning workshop was then followed by a side event at COP19, uh, and that was held uh, just this past Friday a few days ago, uh, where we took some lessons learned from that two-day workshop, presented them to a, a broader audience uh, through COP19. Uh, so then, this is really an opportunity to continue the discussions that we've been having on those two days, uh, and to also embed our discussions of agriculture and national adaptation plan plans in a deeper framework, in a landscapes framework. Um, and so uh, I, I think we've brought together a pretty good panel to do that today. Um, but just for s uh, some very brief background, because I am going to pass it over to, to Gabby here on the end soon, and she'll talk a little more about uh, what is a NAP, um, what an, a NAP is not. Um, uh, lots of puns happening this week, as you can imagine, around, around napping and power napping and uh, it kind of never ending. Um, but the, the NAP process really started uh, with COP16 and the uh, Cancun adaptation framework. Um, and, and, COPs are in, and NAPs are really intended to be medium and long-term um, planning processes for adaptation uh, in a variety of sectors. Uh, but they're also, they're designed not necessarily to, to follow directly off of NAPAs, um, because you can have a NAP and not have have created a NAPA first. Um, so it really incorporates a, a planning process for LDCs and non-LDCs. Um, and the process is designed to be um, iterative. That is, it's not, uh, the development of a NAP is not a one-off process. It's something that needs consistent revisiting. Um, and I think another pillar of the NAP um, is that uh, it's really a, aims at embedding adaptation planning into existing development and sector plans. Um, as well. So uh, those are the main characteristics and, and given those characteristics, really what we want to explore today um, <coughs> is, is what potential does do NAPs and the NAP process um, have in facilitating some cross-sectoral planning um, between sectors like agriculture and forestry and energy and water. Um, and so uh, that's what we, we hope we can accomplish today. Um, some, by way of brief introduction, I just want to go down the line. I'm going to start with Gabby and come, come back to me here. Um, but we have with us today uh, Gabby Kissinger. She's from Lexine Consulting, and she's the, the principal author behind the National Adaptation Plan um, document, the Metasynthesis document. Um, and so Gabby will kind of take us through uh, that process uh, um, and her review of, of um, countries engaging in the NAP, NAP process. Um, and then I think we're really fortunate uh, for the composition of the rest of the panel here because um, Stephen, who's, who's next here from uh, Kenya's Ministry of Environment, Water, and Natural Resources, um, and Jai Mishra right here, closest to me, and Kofi Delali in the middle, um, come from countries that have very different institutional structures, very different planning structures, uh, and different processes for, for cross-sectoral planning. Um, 
And so we're fortunate to have all of these individuals here. Jai uh, Mishra is from the uh, National Planning Commission or just the Planning Commission in India. Um, and Kofi Dalali is from Ghana's Ministry of Food and Agriculture. Um, re regarding the format today for the discussion, um, we're kind of bucking the system a bit and we're going to show a couple presentations here. The idea is for this to be more of a discussion forum, um, but I think there is space for some general introductory comments from each of these countries and so uh, the slides will help to facilitate that. Um, so uh, Gabby will go first. Uh, we'll have Stephen then uh, talk a little bit about some successes in Kenya and developing NAPs. Um, Jai, I think Mishra is going to talk a little bit about two specific programs in India that, uh, that involve cross-sectoral planning. Uh, and then uh, Mr. Dalali is going to talk a bit about Ghana's Akrapong approach uh, to cross-sectoral planning, which was used in the development of their national climate adaptation plan. Really what I, what I wanted to take from this, this is a video that was shown at the end of today's Climate Smart Agriculture sub-plenary session. Um, and I think that Andy Jarvis, who's going to join us here in a few minutes, who's one of the theme leaders for CCAFs and, and is um, the leader of the Decision and Policy Analysis Program at SEAT, um, to reiterate something that Andy said is that, you know, a few years ago, CCAFs set out to with this hypothesis that when we pursue climate smart agriculture that there's always going to be trade-offs between adaptation, mitigation, and production, food production. And a few years down the road now we've seen that sometimes it's difficult when we pursue climate smart agriculture to identify those trade-offs. What we're finding really is synergies. Um, and I can't show you the video, obviously, but we do have a, a new publication out that looks at these climate smart practices in about 16 um, countries. Um, not trying to hawk any product here, but I think that this is a really great read, um, and it does speak to the, some of the topics and the landscape issues that we're, we're going to talk about today. But following Andy's comment, uh, Mr. Deborn Chibonga of the Malawi Farmers Federation stated something very simply that I think frames our discussion quite well, is that you know, farmers don't wake up and say, today I'm going to do mitigation, um, or today I'm going to do adaptation. But I would extend it a bit further and say, you know, today I'm, I'm not going to practice sustainable land management, or I'm not going to practice uh, water management or energy conservation. Um, Rural producers don't think in this way, and I think one of the issues that we're going to address today is that uh, how is we as researchers, how can we as researchers and as governments, as service providers, uh, continue to operate in the silos in the way that we do? Um, and so I think we'll, we'll probably touch on some of those issues in, in the discussion uh, later on. But I'd like to pass it over to Gabby now. Um, and Gabby, I'll run through your slides, and you just tell me when to move. Yeah, how about uh, I'll, I'll stick my pin up. When that's I'm even better. Here. Great. Switch. Um, just a, a few sh quick photos here from the NAP Learning Workshop that happened a, a few days, uh, Wednesday and Thursday of this week, um, and then also from the uh, side event just on Friday. That's great. Is this on? Yeah, I guess it is. So, um, so this report um, <clears throat> is uh, is really about what different, uh, you know, it, it, different, different countries in this process um, of, so you got to be looking at me. <laughs> um, you know, so as countries engage in NAPs, um, which, you know, it can take many different shapes. And countries might have gone through NAPAs, they might have national climate change action plans, they might have national adaptation plans, they might have sub-regional uh, re or even local plans. And <clears throat> countries are trying to figure out, you know, how do we not reinvent the whole wheel here? We're, we're already um, <coughs> down this pathway. So how does a NAP fit with what the national processes are. So when the UNFCCC um, really identified within the Cancun, the, the whole 2010 adaptation framework, um, you know, it was, it was really saying that 
Um, what a NAP is, um, is for the least developed uh, nations, it's, you know, it's meant to build off of the N NAPA for others. Um, it's a process of um, simply going through and um, stock taking, figuring out what vulnerability and risk assessment information you have. Um, how to um, develop policy frameworks around that. So the, um, there are, um, and with the, with the UNFCCC technical guidelines, I forget exactly when those came out, but um, they establish really a, a sort of threshold for um, those countries that are developing this to um, assess what the key aspects are they need to pursue. And then the least developed countries expert working group came up with technical guidelines um, for NAPS as well. That was at the end of 2012. A fantastic document. Um, it really builds upon different, different LDC experiences, developed country experiences. Um, so there's, there's a lot to, to build on here. The, um, the important thing I think for us to keep in mind, let's do a slide switch here. <laughs> <laughs> as you're drinking, um, <clears throat> is, you know, really that um, there's a lot countries can engage. You know, we start with this concept of, of NAPs, which were focused around, and that's the green dot in the middle there. NAPAs were about short-term, immediate adaptation needs. So process was started in 2001, 2002. Countries were really identifying. In fact, it was just a you know, project list. It was what are your urgent adaptation needs? And as countries proceeded down that pathway, some of the most recent NAPAs, like I think Nepal's came out in 2012, and that NAPA looks very similar to a NAP. <laughs> Um, because there was a lot of learning that went on in these processes, the vulnerability and risk assessment processes got better, there was more information to build upon, there was more um, just identification of mainstreaming, um, LAPAs, these, these local efforts to identify adaptation needs and plans. So um, in any country that you look at, with the LDC certainly, you're going to have the, the, the NAPA green circle in the middle. Um, for others, you'll have this greener outer uh, cir circle of, um, you know, all of the other important adaptation plans, whether they're national climate change plans, local adaptation plans, etc. The idea of a NAP here is that it is um, bringing all of those elements together, and it's um, really about mainstreaming into development plans, uh, you know, se sector plans, figuring out how to embed adaptation in those approaches. And I think what the connection here is to the, to the landscape, to the idea of landscapes, um, <clears throat> is really that you have multiple sectors that need to figure out adaptation interests and needs over the long term, over the medium to long term. <clears throat> which is, again, one of these distinguishing aspects of a NAP. It's, it's about long-term planning. And as these sectors figure out what their long-term adaptation needs are, um, there's a need to figure out how to do it together because agricultural adaptation um, cannot be planned and discussed and, you know, you can't troubleshoot issues without looking at water and energy and forests. So <clears throat> our challenge in the NAP process um, is really how do you bring these different sectors together? In the very beginning process of establishing your initial planning all the way through to budgeting, figuring out capacity development, stakeholder engagement, and then implementing. This is a really important tool for us to figure out how cross-sectorally this can happen. So one interesting example, there was a, um, the, the World Bank completed a series of different country assessments looking at economic impacts. Um, so really, you know, what does, what are the, uh, what are the economic impacts of, you know, cl climate change and what, what adaptation options do countries have and how do they understand what the cross-sectoral trade-offs and different synergies are based on that economic assessment? which a lot of developing countries really don't have enough information here. And in their current planning documents really highlight 
that they need more information to understand what the livelihood trade-offs are, what the economic <coughs> development trade-offs are. So with the Ethiopian example, I just want to highlight this really quick. There are other, other countries that they did this in. But really, you know, this was looking at agriculture, um, hydropower, and roads, and looking at the trade-offs there. And their assessment based on vulnerability and risk assessments over the long term, looking at different climate change scenarios, what parts of the country might be affected, looking at the current development plans and understanding what is the long term trajectory of that without any adaptation intervention at all versus what if you do intervene, um, what are the gains to be made from that. And, and um, it was very interesting, you don't, I don't think you want to take this. Um, you know, simply on the face of it, but it allows you to see that um, with the agriculture side, um, it's really at, at great risk in part because of dry areas, um, that if you pursued the hydropower option and actually pursued the current government development plans to develop hydropower without thinking about agricultural water needs, agriculture would be devastated. Incredible yield drops, um, over important areas, um, 250,000 hectares, um, where they would actually revert from irrigated conditions um, to, to rain fed. Um, so this is where thinking about, you know, the, the landscape's framing um, and how to assess trade-offs is, is so important. So um, <clears throat> just touching on a few things here, really it's you know, when we look at the integration with the sector plans, you know, development plans, how do we actually, op, you know, how do, how do we make this happen? For a lot of countries, it's just really challenging because government departments are fairly siloed, budget making decisions are fairly siloed. Um, NAPs really force us to, to rethink how that can happen. And, um, and what the NAPs as well um, challenge us to do uh, let's see if I have this slide here. <clears throat> I'm just going to breeze through, actually. Let's go to the next one as well. Um, well, okay, I'll stop on this one for a minute. <clears throat> um, because this is, you know, this is also when you think about bringing different sectors together for, for planning. What we currently know in the NAP funding process with the multilaterals and international sources of funding for this is that there's money for planning and for the preparatory, um, the different activities, but no one really knows how we're going to fund the whole implementation side of it, which will be the largest wedge of that uh, cir circle. So, um, so we, need to, we need to figure that out. And that's also something when countries are in this NAP planning process, the more that they can find um, you know, important domestic sources of funding. Kenya has some great examples here. We'll hear more about that. Um, this is a really important way of identifying how to be sustainable in the NAPS process in terms of financing it, um, but as well as all of the institutional frameworks um, that are so important to make it uh, last over time. So, um, and that's really um, linking to uh, part of this framework that we developed in that NAPS meta-analysis an report. Um, looking at different pillars, it actually provides sort of a dashboard of how you can assess NAPs at different national scales over time. And one of the important elements of this framework is for countries to really assess what the political economy is. How can you, when you look at adaptation, um, it's oftentimes actually implemented at, you know, lo local scales. <clears throat> and this is also where this, this landscape <laughs> approach and the cross-sectoral trade-offs becomes very real and very and just very tangible. So how do you have in your national planning process, how do you have downward accountability so that you're actually engaging local scales, you're engaging stakeholders um, in, in ways that um, are really effective, that not only bring them into that process but actually develop capacity at the scales needed to address adaptation. Um, and how do you create institutions that are adaptable? Um, this, is a, this is one area where, in, just in terms of governance theory, <laughs> there's a lot of work to be done here. Um, but NAPs offer us a chance to think about that. And um, I think that's the last slide. Oh, yes, yeah, so just to 
just to wrap up again, you know, so with the workshop in here, we can flip. This is our group that met earlier this week. Ten different countries coming together. Um, and, you know, again, this aspect of, so what does it really take for countries to implement NAPS? How do they get cross-sectoral engagement happening? How do you embed it in your development plans? Our group um, of 10 different, uh, uh, you know, national um, approaches ranked and tallied the different government agencies that they each have that are um, either part of this process now or need to be. And so, actually, I'm just going to get up so I can read this. <laughs> so, the most important um, institution is the Climate Change Council. And then the finance agency, very important. So, you know, oftentimes we think about ministries of the environment, ministries of agriculture, very important, but finance is more important. So we've got to get our finance committees on board. Um, of course, we also have Ministry of Agriculture, Environment, we've got um, National Planning Commissions. And then below that, in terms of ranking, um, we have the executive branch, the, the um, uh, I, <laughs> I can't really read that, I think it's a climate change integration guidelines, I don't even know what that is, budget guidelines, parliamentary select committees, donor budget support, and development par partners. So last slide here, um, countries also based on where they are right now, looked at barriers. What are the key barriers that they're facing right now? And um, the top one is lack of organization in their access to finance. So um, <clears throat> there was also a lack of dedicated finance instruments for climate change at a national le level. And then below that, so we've got finance as the top two, which is really interesting. And then insufficient consideration of climate change issues in national policies and uh, pro programs then unclear funding to actually implement, an inadequate appreciation of investments in adap uh, ad adaptation. Um, then we get into the, the science, a lack of long series climate data, the high cost of international expertise, infrastructure and tools for climate re research. And then we come back to the finance piece again, the need for adequate financial planning and then the last one was a lack of baseline data. So, um, so finance is, is a really key piece here. Um, just want to leave you um, with, uh, you know, just a, you know, I hope that you'll grab one of these um, little data sticks, take this report with you. Um, we welcome feedback and um, look forward to the rest of the comments from the panel. Great. Thank you, Gabby. I uh, apologize for the kind of technical issues here that uh, some, I think we're dealing with translation between Mac and, and old PC software here. So there's been some corruption of files. Um, that's curious. Um, I want to pass over now to Stephen, uh, and I will have another chance here at the introduction since I screwed them up a little bit when I, when I first started. But uh, Stephen Kinguyu is, is Kenya's, with Kenya's Ministry of Environment, Water, and Natural Resources. Um, also is a coordinator of Kenya's climate change action plan uh, as well. So we're very lucky to have him here with us today. Um, so Stephen, over to you for some comments. Thank you. Thank you, Chase. Uh, let's just move to the next slide. Thank you. I, 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 I'll try as much as possible to, to share one or two lessons that we have learned along the way in the process of developing first the national climate change action plan and uh, in particular the national adaptation plan that we are just about to complete. And I will address uh, two broad uh, aspects. One, stakeholder uh, involvement or inclusiveness in terms of uh, stakeholder outreach or consultations. And uh, in brief, uh, I've just outlined uh, a mapping of uh, our stakeholders. We have Mwanainchi uh, Kiswahili for the, the common man and the it actually means in Kiswahili, it means the owner of the land. So, and uh, it has a lot of connotations because uh, you elect your leaders, it's the manager who elects the leaders. And you, you, they, we want to tell them that they, because they are the owners of the land, then they have uh, the scope also to decide on the way that uh, 
the country should uh, undertake certain aspects, especially those impacting on, uh, on, the, on them. And therefore, we think they are an important group. And then uh, we have the private sector because we know a lot of investments, of course, will be done by the private sector to address climate change. And of course, the, the private sector also, some of the large scale farmers uh, ideally can be uh, categorized as uh, the private sector. Then we have, uh, of course, the academia, the research institutions. I've grouped them just as academia, but then it's a, it's a, loaded, uh, it's a loaded category. And then on the other side, we have, of course, development partners because we know we we'll need the intervention of uh, our partners, of course, to implement many of the aspects of uh, the action plan and, uh, and uh, also the national adaptation plan. And then uh, I will skip the media, I'll come to the CSOs. And we picked the CSOs deliberately. We had, uh, in the process, we have had uh, two CSOs, one a conglomeration of, uh, or consortium, of course, uh, composed of uh, over 300 uh, local CSOs and NGOs working on climate change-related uh, work. And then we had one representing what we consider to be international CSOs uh, working in climate change. And uh, the reasoning was simple that uh, they have had a way of uh, working with the uh, communities at the very basic level, at the very community level, that perhaps uh, that experience the government might not have had, uh, the, the kind of experience that they, have, they might have uh, uh, acquired. And then uh, we have the media, and uh, the media, I, I used to belong to a committee of the World Ministry Organization called for uh, Communication, Outreach, and Public Education. And uh, uh, out of that experience then, I have learned to value the, the role of the media. And one time I sat with the media and the media told, uh, told me they don't see a category that specifically addresses them. And uh, they actually told me that they are called the third, uh, the fourth estate, and they are not called the fourth estate for nothing. It's because they can either say what you want to say if you say it, or discern what you should say and perhaps say it not the way that you would want it to be said. And because, uh, because of that then, in other words, I'm saying they are the tools or the, 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 the pathways that then many times we would use then to reach the communities and uh, other stakeholders and pass many of the important pieces of uh, information. And then at the bottom, the, the bottom right, we have the government of Kenya, of course, uh, again as a stakeholder. And I want just to say that uh, although the government looks like a big giant, we want to look at all those stake, uh, stakeholder categories as uh, people or as categories who have a stake in climate change related work and in a, a especially adaptation and resilience building related work. I will tell you one story before I move from that, from, from that, uh, that one time, I, my initial chat, I had uh, the Mwanaenji at the bottom. I, we, this, this was a difficult process. We learned a lot by doing. Sometimes we make a small mistake, you learn from, from the process. And the, a, a stakeholder raised, uh, raised up some disappointment, and I was wondering what's the problem, because from a scientific, my, my background as a scientist, I thought they would understand this one to be like a radial diagram where you have spokes coming from the center, the action plan, and then everybody's equal. But uh, there, the, the, it was a lady, her interpretation was that I'm showing that the government is at the top, the one is at the, at the bottom. And uh, I have learned a lot. I don't want to belabor that fact. But what I'm trying to, 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 to underline is that uh, stakeholders want to be treated as very important people. You catch them at their own terms. You cannot catch fish at the fisher's own terms. If fish feeds at 12 o'clock, you cannot go fishing at 8 o'clock and expect to find fish. And if fish feeds on worms, you can take the best barbecue for all I care. You are not going to catch them because their barbecue or their, 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 their most delicious meal is worms, so you have to carry worms with you. And this is the idea because we go out there we want to go and do stakeholder consultations. But then we go with preconceived, preconceived uh, ideas. We think we are going to talk to people who have got no information in their heads. So we go out to tell them what they must do. That fails the test of a stakeholder consultation uh, process. The stakeholder consultation process, you go, you listen to the people. You don't go with academic uh, big words because you scare them again. And therefore, that's why I put uh, my two points here. They are like fish, you catch them at their own terms. And then they are like eggs. You must handle them with care. You must speak a language that they identify with. We told the consultants that we were going with to the field 
that they cannot go and start asking stakeholders, are you talking about adaptation or are you talking about mitigation? That's not their business. They just share with you their issues, their experiences in relation to climate change and what the suffering they are going through and what they are already doing to address that. And then they tell you, this is what we are not able to do and we think it should be done. So that you identify the gaps. It is your business as a consultant or as a technical right, to go and sit now on your desk and analyze those issues. And they then know that this one was talking about mitigation, this was talking about uh, adaptation and so on and so forth. Let me go to the next slide because yes. of time. So the other aspect, I've just put a crazy patchwork of uh, different photos because the idea is you learn then through the, the, this experience, the, the, through this process, then you start learning that you cannot pick out agriculture as a standalone, uh, standalone entity. Agriculture is integrated with the environment, with the water sector, with the energy sector, among, and amongst others that we many times we do not think about when we are thinking about climate change related issues, like planning. Because then, as you look at issues to do with energy, because agriculture will need energy, water, of course, as you, you, you might think that you are going to build dams, and then the dams, like at the bottom, I have a, actually that's one of our hydro power generation dams. But at the same time, it's a multi-purpose dam that is also used for agricultural purposes, for irrigation, for domestic use, uh, for domestic purposes, and also to supply some of the urban centers, of course, in the, in the neighborhood. And therefore, there is no way that you can separate energy and from, uh, from agriculture, because while you tap from the same source, the dam, agriculture will also actually feed from energy, because then you need energy to drive agricultural processes. We have realized this in our vision 2030, where, of course, we have underlined energy as the driver of development. Without addressing energy, then we may not talk about much about even developing in the agriculture sector. And uh, another thing that I can mention in relation to energy is uh, we rely so much on uh, hydro energy. It's clean energy, fine. But then we also have uh, a very high potential of up to 10,000 megawatts of energy or potential for geothermal development. We have only exploited about 10% of that. The beauty of uh, geothermal compared to hydro, of course, is that uh, while both of them are clean energy, geothermal is not sensitive to climatic fluctuations. So as you develop, as we move towards uh, the developing of ge geothermal, enhancing, of course, uh, the pace at which we develop our geothermal sector, then we are also enhancing our resilience, the energy sector resilience. And energy re uh, sector resilience also means agriculture sector resilience because agriculture will rely on, on that energy. Then there is also, of course, the interface between uh, the, the forestry, forestry, the environment, and then, of course, uh, other factors. Uh, at, the, at the top left, I actually have a, a farmer that we used for a, 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 research, or a, a, a research project that we carried out on uh, the benefits of... Uh, uh, the social economic benefits of uh, climate and weather information. And uh, that's a farmer, of course, is relying on a totally different sector to build his resilience because then he goes to talk to the weatherman, he goes to talk to the agriculture ex extension officer, and he talks to many other experts, of course, so that then he can know what he must do, what he should not do in a certain season, of course, given uh, the prevailing conditions. So I, I, I just want to, post, uh, to, to stop at that point then and not forget the bottom left, the, that's a lady going out to look for water, of course, uh, with a donkey. And uh, many times we forget also to integrate issues related to gender, gender, gender parities as we address climate change adaptation and uh, even mitigation for sure. And these are important aspects because uh, every time I see this, I, I, where I have my rural home, I, I'm talking like a Kenyan now, because in Kenya you have a town home, you have a rural home. And uh, where I have, that's where I keep my goats in the rural home and my small number of sheep. And uh, I see guys passing early in the morning. They are either kids or women. And whenever I see a man driving a donkey to the river, I ask myself, or sometimes I ask my own farm boy, I ask him, whose worker is that one? Whose? I don't ask whose son. I ask whose worker. Because I know if a man is driving a donkey to the river, he's either a very poor person without a family, or he's somebody who is employed. Do you see? And therefore, everyone else who you see from the family will either be a child 
or a woman. That's the African culture, of course. And therefore, we must address these things. There is no way that we can address. So we are talking about the integration of the different sectors as we address adaptation in agriculture and in other sectors. Thank you. Thank you, Stephen. I, um, the initial plan was to allow each of the speakers to go through and then uh, kind of do some meta comments at the end. But if there's anything targeted to Stephen, um, I think maybe now is the time to open it up so we have some, some participation from the audience. So if there's something that you have uh, for Stephen about the National Climate Change Action Plan, about um, their process for stakeholder consultation, um, uh, any direct comments for Stephen at the moment? Okay, we'll save them then for the meta, meta commentary at the end. Oh, let me go back here. Nah. Okay, I'd like to at this point then introduce Mr. Kofi Delali from the Ministry of Food and Agriculture of Ghana. And, uh, go ahead. And Co Kofi here is going to talk a little bit about um, the Akrapong pr approach, um, which was a cross-sector planning approach used in the development of, of Ghana's National Climate uh, Adaptation Plan. Um, and so we'll have um, Delali about five minutes or so to, to be able to discuss that plan. If you go over, that's, that's okay as well. Thank you, Chase. Um, I will first of all like to say that for a subject like climate change, planning to address it, we need to take into consideration the fact that it cuts across almost every facet of our livelihoods. Therefore, you cannot be looking at it just from your individual perspective. You must also think about how it affects others, both human beings, institutions, and landscapes, or what have you. Ghana, in the process of uh, developing a national climate change uh, strategy, put that into consideration and adopted a cross-sectoral approach. But again, for you to be able to do that, you need to base that process on some information. And for our case, the process was started with getting experts to undertake vulnerability assessments of various sectors and came up with proposed adaptation actions for the individual sectors. That formed the basis of the process. By the end of the fair adaptation uh, vulnerability assessment, we came up with about 75 proposed adaptation actions, 75 across the various sectors. And that was a task for an expert group to work on to bring down as much as possible. The integration of the various sectors, options into, the, uh, into uh, uh, the development can be challenging. Looking at the numbers that we have, 75 into a national development plan can be very challenging. And under the, like I said, under the process, we brought in experts from all the sectors to sit together as a group, not individuals. So you have an agricultural expert, you have an energy expert, you have somebody from health, all sitting together and working on these 75 individual sector uh, options. The next one. So as they did that, they tried to scale down the numbers and harmonize them now across the sectors. And they did that and reduced the number. And the next thing they did was to prioritize the, uh, the, uh, the harmonized uh, adaptation process using a multi-criteria analysis. And one of the things they were looking at was also to try to reduce conflicts as much as possible and also enhance synergies. In this one. 
So in doing that, they came up with a number of now uh, actions for adaptation. So the result of the expert group was now subjected to a, a broader cross-sectorial stakeholder for uh, uh, endorsement. And the stakeholders also resubjected the, uh, the proposed options also to a multi-criteria analysis and validated and endorsed. Now, we are talking about cross-sectorial adaptation options. So the, the last step we took, the process took, was to use an ecosystem-based and a programmatic-based approach to again bring down these uh, ranked uh, adaptation uh, action options into 10 program areas, into 10 program areas. So from 75 individual adaptation options, we ended up with what? 10 adaptation uh, programs. And when you study these individual program areas carefully, you realize that there might be an emphasis on an area, but you also realize that it creates an opportunity for other sectors to also work within that program. The idea is that the individual sector program, uh, sectors will then look at these individual uh, adaptation uh, program areas and identify areas of entry into their sector uh, development plans and policies, uh, policies and plans. The good thing is that so far we've had two uh, projects that have been developed uh, out of this uh, climate change strategy. And it has now formed the basis of the national climate change policy that is just getting to, uh, which development is just getting to conclusion. This is the process that was uh, adopted for, that I've just talked about. This is the process. Let's go. And I want to mention that the reason why I brought out the people who was responsible for this, uh, the development of this approach is that to have an effective adaptation plan requires if, uh, somebody who can apply a, uh, uh, an approach to facilitate the process which means that you need some amount of capacity to lead the process. And this particular approach was developed by Ken Benedict and uh, the former climate change focal person for the country. And those who might be interested in getting to know the details of, approach, uh, of the approach can go to the website of Science Review. It is there you download it for, I think, $41 for a download. Then now, why are we calling it a crop approach? It was developed and for the first time used for this process in one of the towns very close to the city called Acropon. That's why they just named it Acropon. Thank you. So that was a Acropon approach for climate change adaptation planning. Thank you, Delali. Uh, are there any specific questions uh, directed towards Delali at this point? Yes, sir. Uh, let's get a, a Romy mic. Oh, son, I'll hand you this one, uh, or perhaps uh, the one in front of Stephen is fine. Thank you. Yes, um, thank you very much. My name is Patrick, uh, coming from Ghana, <laughs> but um, currently I'm in Germany, 
doing a research work on climate change. And mine is not a question, it's um, an appeal to you. Since we are all coming from the same country, I'm happy to see you here. I want um, a copy of the Acropon approach without any $41. <laughs> <laughs> and then a copy of the Ghana climate change policy because I am doing um, a thesis, a work on this um, climate change stuff, but unfortunately when you go to the internet, you don't get, the, especially the climate change policy is not um, available on the internet and it's a, a big problem for me in my research work, so I'll be very happy to um, have this document from you to help me with my study in Germany. Thank you very much. <laughs> okay. Um, for the Acropol approach, I think uh, Mr. Ajibabonsu is in Bonn. Yeah, so you can go to the UNFCC headquarters in Bonn and talk to him personally. I think he will be happy to give you, give it to you because uh, some of these things you must be careful. <laughs> About the national climate change policy, when we, after the meeting, let's meet and discuss that one. Maybe, Dalali, you can give us an update as to, as to where the, that policy is in, in the policy process. I think that there's a lot of people interested in the Ghana experience. Um, so perhaps just a brief update as to where the national climate change policy is. Uh, okay. Um, the Ghana National Climate Change Policy School is to uh, to enhance social development along a low carbon growth path. And um, we have now completed the main policy framework and working on individual sector strategies. Five I think yeah, five priority sectors has been identified, including agriculture, health, water, uh, I think water, energy, and uh, waste management. I think so. Yeah, those are the major of the five sectors that have been identified, and uh, strategies have been developed for each of them. And um, we are now revising the strategies. The cabinet has given approval to the policy uh, itself. And after the refining of the strategies, the next step will be to subject these strategies to sector stakeholders for validation. And once that is done, then it is expected that the various sectors will start uh, including this in their annual work plans and uh, budgets. Because the thinking is that as far as much as we are looking for support to implement this project, Ghana now, as a, an economy in transition, must also, on its own, show commitment to uh, implementing this as part of the journey towards sustainable development. Thank you, Delali. Uh, any other questions from the audience for Delali <coughs> at this point? Uh, if not, then we'll move on to Jai Mishra here from the Planning Commission at, of uh, India. Um, and uh, Jai is going to speak about two separate initiatives that are, that are happening in India that have uh, cross-sectoral planning implications. Um, so, Mr. Mishra, it's up to you. Thank you, Chaz. Uh, as in every country, India has also uh, appreciated the climate change and its impact on agriculture. We have an apex body under the Prime Minister, that is the National Action Plan on Climate Change. And uh, there is a dedicated Climate Change Secretariat uh, under the Prime Minister. We have been uh, able to draft the National, national Action Plan and eight national missions under that uh, NAPCC which also envisages the mainstream those uh, action plans into the development plans during 12 plan. Taking leave from that uh, national action plans and the national missions uh, that have been uh, done under national action plan on climate change, there are two major initiatives that has been taken in the beginning of the 12th plan or even one year before the 12th plan that starts from 
2012-13. One is on the research front, that is National Initiative on Climate Resilient Agriculture, which basically revolves around strategic research, outreaching to the farmers, and capacity building, which is very much important and very much lacking, at least at the middle and lower level of the rung, so far as climate change is concerned. The National Mission on Sustainable Agriculture is another mission which is launched to mainstream the learnings of the National Initiative on Climate Resilient Agriculture to, to scale up those learnings. Apart from that, uh, there are a number of other programs which are already in, in the operation. And one is the, the Mahatma Gandhi National Impl Rural Employment Guarantee Act which provides minimum rozgar, uh, minimum employment guarantee for 150 days to a non-employed person who haven't been to any of the employment. Along the, with that, the integrated watershed management program is also there. And they, both the programs are having very good component of uh, ecological services. As I told, national uh, initiative on climate resilient agriculture has three basic components strategic research that is for upstream research and development of new plant types for the climatic uh, change situations and uh, reaching to the farmer uh, with the kind of uh, modules we are having uh, already pre already we are having in the national agriculture research system and elsewhere and capacity building of the stakeholders of the institutions as well as the farmers. How we started this, we, we assess the vulnerability to climatic stresses and extreme events in the, all the districts of the country. There are around 570 rural districts. And out of that, 100 districts have been taken up in the plan period. And there are specific suite of uh, technology modules which have been already identified and they, are, they have been put uh, uh, to the testing in the identified villages. And entire village, not one or two or three farmer, but entire village of a particular vulnerable district was adapted. And those suitable modules have been showcased to the farmers so that they are well conceived and in the process in every process, all the stakeholders of that particular districts, right from the development people to farmers to NGOs to social groups, have been involved uh, right from planning to uh, implementation of that particular uh, module. And on the basis of that, now 150 climate smart villages are already developed in as many districts. And these have been the climate smart practices under which the entire climate smart villages have been revolving. Basic focus has been because these are the areas where most of the land of the farming falls under rain fed conditions. And in India, about 56% of agricultural land is under rain fed condition, only 44% is irrigated. So given uh, those in the background, the most important activity have been revolving around how to conserve the uh, underground water, how to uh, harvest the surface water, and how to increase the efficiency of pumping through better and energy efficient pumps. There are alternate uh, rice uh, practices, because in India, rice is the major crop accounting about 44 million hectare. And it is uh, almost uh, irrigated uh, by about 56%. And uh, in the irrigated areas, mostly it is submerged uh, throughout the season. So alternate betting kind of practices have been uh, advised to the farmers. They have been put in their fields. They have been given the uh, literatures. And they have been also told that even with that practice, you can harvest more. Livestock feeding, shelter, and manure management is one important aspect which have been tried there because uh, it also emits a lot of uh, methane. Once we are now able to have some uh, climate smart villages, now how to scale up those? <laughs> 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 
to scale up those we have now in the 12 five year plan because in india every five year plan is uh, launched with the approval of the national development council which is chaired by prime minister and then it is vetted in the by the parliament now this mission has already been approved and vetted by the parliament and the kind of outlay that we are having for this mission is uh, 2000 million us dollars and most important thing would be there to have micro irrigation efficient use of tools and capacity building uh, about 5% of the total allocation is also there for capacity building of the institutions because one of the primary and major critical gap what we experienced in the country is the capacity of the institution whether it is for finance arranging finances or whether it is implementing and uh, uh, appreciating the climate change especially at the middle and uh, lower level is very much lacking and in india because uh, agriculture is a state subject so unless you build the capacity of those institutions something uh, very concrete on climate change and its adaptation is uh, rather difficult so that uh, we are focusing in the 12 plan and we hope that uh, with those activities we will be able to develop a very good programmatic intervention through all those activities thank you thank you mishra are there any comments directly related to india's cross sectoral planning processes. We have one up here at the panel from Gabby. And, and you have a microphone right in front of you, so go ahead and jump on in there. Um, so I'm curious on this second to last bullet, integrated farming and watershed plus approach. Can you speak more to what exactly that is? Because of, uh, we have two programs. One is integrated watershed development program already being implemented by ministry of uh, rural development in the country and uh, the another is uh, that national mission on sustainable agriculture which is being implemented by ministry of agriculture so integrated watershed plus means uh, those areas which are not within that uh, particular micro watershed so beyond that and the farmers are given even more are uh, facilitated even more in terms of uh, Uh, tea plantation livestock and all those things rather from only cropping they are even uh, given with uh, other activities and other uh, uh, assistance for uh, or you can say the technological support for the uh, other activities of the agriculture as a whole because in india uh, livestock cropping and also research is part of agriculture uh, and fisheries also it is not in a different domain it is a, in in a single domain of agriculture thank you um at this point i think we'll we have a few targeted questions up here at least i have a list of kind of running questions that i had uh for the panelists um so we'll take a couple minutes i'll ask a few questions here and direct them towards the panelists um but then uh, i'd like to open it up to the floor uh, in particular we're interested in in hearing um other countries experiences in cross sectoral planning um we've had a, an opportunity to explore some cases from Kenya and Ghana and India which is already <coughs> quite a diverse lot um so while we're having this next little uh, moderated bit i'm i'm hoping that you'll be able to uh, bring up some of your own experiences uh, and then uh, we'll come to that just next okay um I, There was a, a few statements in a few side events that I, I went to yesterday in some of the technical and networking sessions, and I think Seth, this may have happened in in, um, in your session, Seth from Eco Agriculture Partners, um, is that when we think of landscapes, a landscape isn't only in, an ecological concept; it's it's a socio-ecological concept, and so there are uh, very much implications that very many implications that institutional design can have. Um, 
in particular, uh, processes of, of uh, institutions like land tenure, for example, have, have pretty serious implications for the way that we go about landscape planning. Um, and so I'm wondering if any of the panelists, if you can speak to the importance of, of those higher level institutional processes like land tenure or like administrative um, design um, and uh, some, maybe some implications for your own country context. And Stephen, I see you writing um, right now. Uh, I'm wondering if you've had any uh, insight into the implications of, of, of those things. Well, thank you, Chase. I, I, I was writing my own notes, but fine. <laughs> so <laughs> first, I think I, 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 something that perhaps I need to share with the, the participants about um, the importance of the uh, baseline information, because then there is no, I think times have changed and we need also to be able to, to measure the benefits and uh, the performance of our systems and then the benefits of course accruing from certain, uh, certain uh, new ideas and therefore when we look at the NAP, many times uh, when we are looking at uh, say mitigation actions, it's very easy because uh, there is some direction in terms of uh, the MRV of the uh, mitigation actions. But then we also need to be able to measure the uh, socioeconomic benefits accruing from uh, adaptation actions. We need to measure the, to, to be able to uh, estimate uh, the, 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 the performance of uh, whatever initiatives that we have, uh, we have put in place. And uh, here then I, I would want to underline the importance of uh, uh, developing a system of uh, baseline information. And I'll, I'll just throw one to the, to the participants because uh, in our experience we had uh, a case where we realized that the prisons department and who in the world would think that, that uh, anything has to do with adaptation from the prisons department. But we realized the prisons department was actually harvesting rainwater to plant, uh, plant vegetables and uh, at least uh, seasonal crops for their own uh, sustenance. And uh, you see, it, it doesn't look like it has a lot of, because uh, when you are building your baseline data, then you want to put in place, at least you want to, to, uh, to account for all uh, actions that are related to adaptation. And here is one that is actually not labeled as an adaptation program. It's not even labeled like a, as a climate change project, uh, program. And there, that, that, so I just want to throw to the participants to think about the kind of difficulties that one would go through or the kind of process one would go through to come up with a, a comprehensive a baseline information. And then uh, again, uh, in terms of uh, institutional setup, I, I, I would want to talk about uh, from our own experience, uh, the importance of uh, putting in place, uh, okay, uh, roping in the, all the, 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 the categories of, uh, of uh, cat uh, stakeholders. I, I think I want to address it from a stakeholder perspective because we looked at all the government entities as a subcomponent of one stakeholder category called the government. And we looked at the Minister of Planning. Because if we do not look at ourselves as stakeholders, then everyone else outside the government would say, these are government programs, these are government programs. Therefore, they step out. They develop code fit because not, there is not a single entity that would want to compete with the government. But then we would also want to come down to the level of the other stakeholders so that then they start looking at us as, uh, as peers so that then we exchange ideas on how to take uh, the, development, uh, the development agenda of the country forward, including adaptation and sustainable development. And uh, we brought in our Minister of Planning. And uh, the Minister of Planning to us was important, and the, mini uh, and, and the National Treasury, currently, currently is the National Treasury. When we started, it was simply called the Minister of Finance. It is important because uh, if you, look, you, you read our older government documents, they don't, they refer to involving uh, line ministries. Planning is not one of them. And yet it is actually planning that will mainstream, that will help us or facilitate the mainstreaming of uh, climate change concerns, including adaptation aspects into the national development process. And without that being done, then we can keep on uh, handing outside without looking at the worth that is within. Because uh, that's how we have managed at, at least to have uh, within our national development process to have uh, climate change adaptation and mitigation aspects integrated within our planning process. And that's how in the next, because we, we implement our vision 2030, which is the, the blueprint for, for Kenya's development up to 2030, implemented using five-year medium-term plans. And the first medium-term plan 
lapsed in the end of June this year. It did not address climate change. Of course, there are climate change relevant, relevant uh, initiatives, but there is no mention of uh, an initiative that is specifically targeted to address climate change. But for the first time, when we started working with Ministry of Planning, we sensitized them on the need to integrate climate change in national planning. We talked that because uh, the planning process is designed in such a way that you have uh, sector working groups representing the different sectors of the economy. We work with them, we sensitize them, we had a, a, a sensitization workshop actually for the sector uh, working group uh, secretariats, and we sensitize them on the reality of climate change in their own sectors, the issues that they need to address, and the danger of not, or the risk of the, that they, 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 they stand if they do not address uh, those issues and how to go about it, and then we were open to receive, uh, to, 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 to intervene where they required our help, and we as a process also, as part of the process, we also prepared the sector briefing notes for the different sector working groups. This helped because uh, uh, we are talking about institutions because then if, at, at the end of the day, we have for the first time a medium term plan, a five year medium term plan that uh, reads like a climate change document. You read in the narrative, almost a few, every few paragraphs you find something relevant to climate change. And then when you go to the implementation matrix, that ideally uh, list or say enumerate the, the, the proposed uh, initiatives and the proposed budgets. You find climate relevant uh, budgets. You, you, you say you find uh, there is need, blah, 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 to address, uh, say, to increase the percentage of uh, agricultural operations that are based on, so, so that, 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 that depend on the irrigation. Because the current situation was that we had over 90% of our agricultural operations which were in fair. And therefore, because we are in the tropics, again, in a, a semi-arid arid and semi-arid area, you find then our agriculture is so sensitive or so vulnerable to climatic fluctuations. But now, we, be, we underline that fact, and then you find that in the current medium-term plan, there are aspects of uh, increased uh, rainwater, rainwater harvesting to to, 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 to be used for, uh, to provide water for irrigation uh, the, and all sorts of, of, of other things. So I'm underlining the issue of uh, integrating the sectors, but then to inform a national pro planning process. Because uh, we have a separate uh, national plan uh, action, uh, sorry, national adaptation plan. But then already even before we publish that national adaptation plan, it has already the, the issues coming from all the outputs of uh, the national adaptation plan are already informing our national planning. So that as we go out to look for funding from our development partners, then already we are addressing the, 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 the most urgent issues and what we can easily address within the, from, from using uh, funding from our exchequer. That's what we are doing and we have, fund, we, we, we have programmed that for the next five years and we think in the next five year phase it will even be better because then the level of awareness in the different sectors and uh, at the top political level will have increased. So I, I, I think that's a Kenyan experience. Thank you. Right. And uh, Dalali, you have a very different um, institutional structure to that of, of Kenya even. And so I wonder if uh, Kenya, uh, of course, with a, a kind of federal and county-based administration and, and Ghana with more of a unitary structure. Um, so I, I'll get, leave it up here to Dalali. Yeah, I was, um, uh, Chase, thank you. Um, I was actually going to address the question of um, integrating uh, sociocultural issues within this landscape approach. Uh, as you rightly said, Ghana is a unitary state. So most of the national level plans and programs set a framework within which the decentralized structures, which we call the district assemblies, must position their development plans. And in Ghana, taking land tenure as an example, land ownership control and management structures, governance structures, vary across, various, uh, various parts, uh, across the country. And therefore, it is an issue that can be realized at the national level. But to tackle it in the planning process, will be better handled at the lower level, that is, at the decentralized level, where 
the issues will be a little bit more uniform. If you don't address this within that development plan at the district level, before moving into the field to implement, you will be faced with a lot of um, difficulties. We've had examples of uh, uh, chieftains mobilizing their people against implementation of development plans. And this is not just to show power, but it has also been based on experience since the colonial times. Therefore, it is very important in a, uh, planning at that level to, add, uh, to recognize the power and the influence of uh, these traditional authorities in the control and use of the resources and involve them as important stakeholders at that level. Thank you, Delali. Mishra, any, any insights from the India experience? In India, uh, the planning is uh, most decentralized. Most decentralized in the sense uh, there is district planning committees which have representation of all the stakeholders, farmers group, NGOs, lead banking systems, uh, even elected representatives of the uh, Anchayati Raj institutions. And uh, in the long uh, process over the years, now all the plans emanate from the district level itself. They are, they are planned and made by the district uh, level these DPCs. And then uh, the state plans are framed and the national plan is rather indicative. It is not uh, forcing someone uh, on the states or uh, on the districts. It is a kind of broader uh, outlays that provide for a, a given kind of activity. But the actual planning and implementation rests with the districts. And that's the, uh, that's the way how the uh, functioning takes place. Right. Thank you very much. Um, Stephen, you brought up the point of the importance of baseline assessments when we, when we start thinking about national adaptation plans. Um, the other end of that is, is how we monitor success, how we measure success, and against what indicators uh, we do that. Um, and I think one of the major challenges in, in addressing landscape approaches uh, is that we can come in and we can clean out an entire forest and we can cut down an entire forest and that reflects quite um, positively on our national GDP perhaps for about a year and a half or two years. Um, but in the long run, uh, we, we clearly know uh, the challenges that will arise. Um, how important are indicators um, and the reassessment of how we measure success uh, as we move forward and, and how can we incorporate some of these things into national adaptation plans? I think this is a, uh, probably a question that could feel, be fielded by any of the panelists. Um, uh, but Stephen, since you brought up baseline, maybe you can have a first go at it. Thank you, Chase. I, I, I think in brief, uh, <clears throat> in brief, if you do not uh, then uh, think of uh, what indicators that would be necessary, of course, to, to inform uh, the process, and especially at the implementation level, you, uh, you may actually end up thinking that you are adapting, then end up actually causing a lot of maladaptation in the long run, where, uh, where you, you might find you are taking one action here that looks good in the, long, in the short run, and then the, the long, in the long run, you find uh, it causes a, a more costly outcome. And uh, there, 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 there is a danger. One of the processes we, we, we went through uh, during the development of the, the broader climate change action plan, and now, of course, in the upgrading of the adaptation aspects into a national adaptation plan, is to first sit with our national integrated uh, monitoring and, uh, uh, and evaluation, uh, evaluation uh, system, it's called N-I-M-E-S, NIMES, uh, that's how we pronounce it, because they don't want to be called names. Eh? So, <laughs> and uh, we, 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 wanted, we, we wanted first to go through with them to see what indicators exist in the system to inform uh, climate change, and especially in the broader, from the, in the, the, in the broader view, uh, environmental aspects, there were almost no indicators, actually. And we sat with them, 
we sat with the uh, other stakeholders and we tried to come, come up with indicators that would link one action in agriculture with the outcomes perhaps in other sectors, including socioeconomic benefits like job creation or perhaps the, 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 the reduction of the jobs because then the indicator can either go up or, or down. And therefore those are some of the indicators like, like uh, the, the well-being of the people in terms of uh, health benefits, uh, the, 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 in terms of uh, perhaps uh, the cleanness of the jobs or the greenness of the jobs so that then if you are creating jobs, you also don't want to say we have created uh, 10 new jobs without looking at the quality of the jobs. Are they making, are they exposing the people more, they, they, they can get um, 10 more jobs or take 50% more jobs. But then you find actually these jobs, these new jobs are exposing them to more health related problems than, uh, than the old jobs that they were, they, 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 they were crying about. And therefore these are some of the things that we have thought about. We, we, are, we, we don't have a foolproof system but at least we have, come up, we have tried to come up with a certain indicator so that then an action in one sector does not end up causing a negative uh, outcome in a different sector because we are working for the same economy, for the same communities, for the same systems. If we do not adopt well, adapt well in one sector, we will end up actually causing a bigger national program or a uh, problem in the long run, and that's what we are trying to avoid. Thank you. Yes, thank you. Um, I just want to say, first of all, that NAPS as a process are meant to support sustainable development and not individual sector groups. It is very, very important. So with that thinking behind, the indicators for any NAP need to emphasize synergies within uh, the various sectors and not and minimizing the trade-offs. So that should be the basis upon which indicators must be identified and baselines established. In the case of Ghana, we are saying that our national climate change policy has a goal of sustainable socioeconomic growth. What are the indicators of, uh, of socioeconomic growth. If we establish those uh, uh, indicators at the higher level, then we can now look at the individual sector sectors. What indicators under agriculture, for example, will contribute to the attainment of the uh, higher goals? What indicators under energy will contribute? What indicators under waste management will, uh, will contribute? But if we don't do that, then we continue to look at the individual sectors as separate, as uh, you put it, siloed sectors. Then we will not be achieving the nexus that we are, uh, we, we are thinking of. I wanted to give us a chance to open up to the floor, but I'm, I'm wondering first if, Gabby, you have any other comments um, or questions to direct. Yeah, so the one thing to add to this concept of how you measure and monitor and really evaluate change is that, you know, um, when we think about doing this in the adaptation space, um, and you look at different countries and what they're doing to assess what their vulnerability and, and risks are and actually creating baselines there. A lot of countries um, do not have confidence in the sort of data that they have. They're trying to, you know, they're trying to go from course, a course understanding of risk to a finer understanding of risk. So the, just this concept of baselines um, in the adaptation space is really complicated. And what baseline are you assessing? You know, is it rainfall patterns over the last 20 years? Um, you know, how do you how do you really understand what a what a um, appropriate baseline is? And then, what are you measuring change from? And what is that? How do you attribute change properly? You know, how do you attribute if you um, you know, it, when you look at just the confluence of different issues that can affect outcomes, how do you actually attribute um, something to a climate change in, you know, some sort of action or engagement that has occurred versus market forces or um, other things that um, are really complicated? And these are costly processes, and they take a lot of time. 
So <clears throat> one needs to establish at the outset a strong understanding of what the measuring, monitoring, reporting system should be 10 years out or 20 years out, and think about how to, iter how to um, iteratively um, change it over time to really reflect changing information um, and changing reporting requirements and, and a changing sense of, of how you're um, actually understanding what, what attributes come into play. We have a few hands going up here now. Um, Let's take um, about three at a time here now, uh, and then when you get the microphone, just state who you are and which organization you're, you're from, um, and then um, please also direct the question to one of the panelists. Go okay. ahead. My question will go to Kenya. Um, the problem we have in most um, developing countries, especially in Africa, is that uh, politicians always want to implement party manifestos um, instead of plans, development plans and, 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 and stuff like that. I want to find out from Kenya, um, since you mentioned that your five-year development plan, the medium-term plans, initially did not include climate change considerations, but now you want to include it in the future medium-term plans. Um, what has been the success, you know, in terms of implementation of previous plans, that you are sure that this time round, with the climate change things in the next plans, they are going to be implemented. Because if we don't take care what has been done already, if the previous plans were not implemented, where politicians are implementing their party manifestos, at the end of the day, if you put very good climate change strategies in your next medium-term plans, they are not going to be implemented. Thank you very much. Great. Uh, let's go in front here. Is, if, Asana, you can make your way here. We'll take uh, two more questions, and then we'll leave it up to the panelists. Uh, back one more row. Yep. Um, maybe I have one comment and then one question following up his question, actually. Um, I think it's a little bit worrying that under the adaptation, the Cancun adaptation framework, the adaptation fund is practically empty, and that's why you have to go through this whole process of financing to, to get these NAPs going on. But I wonder if you have had any chance to engage under that level, um, trying to push for, for more adaptation funds to actually enter the Cancun adaptation framework. That is maybe one reflection out of this. But my question probably is very much similar to what he has said already, because I understand that you have, like th this is an amazing plan to adapt to climate change specifically, but at the same time, these vulnerable communities are also trying to ad adapt to market forces, to the, the world trade in, in, in terms of agricultural commodities. Um, and I wonder if you, have considered those other challenges that seriously pose, pose a threat in, in the viability and in the progression of these adaptation plans. Because at the end of the road, if, if farmers can't make a living out of these adaptations, then it's kind of hard to balance out what to do. <laughs> Great, thank you. And then in the back right corner, Asana. Yeah, thank you very much, <coughs> yeah, panelists. I'm Richard from Uganda. I work for Uganda Wildlife Authority. And my question uh, goes to all of you three. One of the biggest drivers of deforestation in our country is the agriculture. Because um, almost 60% of the forests in our country are on private land. And right from the policy level, it says that you have right over your land and therefore, you can use the way you want. And uh, they are one of those other policies that we want to produce for export. That means you can cut all the trees and plant maize as, you know, as much as you can. And that is deforestation. I'm wondering how these cross-sector synergies are working in your countries. 
because that's a very big area where you have the foresters and agriculturists uh, conflicting, and it is a big problem in our country. Thank you. Great. Uh, let's try to field some of these questions up front. Um, and I think the first one was directed um, directly at Stephen. I'm, I apologize, Stephen. You've been going first a few times in a row here, but why don't you give that one a shot on party manifestos and plans? Okay. I, I, I think I will. Uh, thank you. I will start from the difficult question that was uh, posed by Patrick. I can still remember his name for the first, uh, from the first question, <laughs> round of questions. And uh, the danger, I think he wants to know the perhaps what kind of uh, the degree of uh, certainty that we have perhaps in, uh, that, uh, in the, that our, our, our initiatives or our proposed interventions will be implemented vis-a-vis uh, -vis political interference, interference through party manifestos. Let me just paint the background of perhaps just as a way of trying to answer that question, how we do our national planning. Uh, we do our national planning every five years. By some co good coincidence, the, actually the planning phase just ends before the, the elections. And what we do, we complete the drafts, the draft medium term plan. And uh, after that, we keep it in abeyance until the elections. And the thinking is, because there are some, in the winning party manifesto, you might find very good uh, initiatives that can be integrated in the medium term plan. And that's exactly what we did uh, this year. And uh, we had uh, the, 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 the winning party's manifesto. By some good coincidence, we had many of the issues that they, 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 they were taking it uh, as flagship uh, projects are uh, actually close. Because we talk to them, we, when you go out to talk to stakeholders again, we tend to forget the politicians. And yet, these are the guys who are going to vote for money either in parliament or in county assemblies. And we talk to them at the county level, we talk to them at the national level. We have had, we have actually had sittings and we are planning even now after pre, uh, uh, launching now the action plan. And now uh, we, we are actually planning this year to have another, another, another round of uh, sensitization of members of parliament. And uh, the, the thinking is because uh, every time you have elections, some of them come back, some of them do not come back. And therefore, you, you lose part of the, 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 the group that already was on, had ownership in the processes and initiatives that you have proposed. So we have done that. Number two, I think what we need to understand, we, we said because we were in a very tricky position or in terms of time, in terms of time or epoch, the, the, the political uh, timeliness, because uh, we were in a transition uh, governance uh, phase where we had... Uh, uh, because uh, after our 2007 elections, uh, we had a small uh, misunderstanding here and there. And therefore, we, we, we went for a coalition government where we had uh, two broad uh, sides coming together, of course, with their small um, party members, of course, to, I mean, parties, smaller parties that were aligned to both sides to form a coalition government. So we had uh, the president coming from one side, and we had a prime minister, which was a, which was a transitional, a transitional uh, post uh, of a prime minister because the constitution, our constitution does not have the post of a prime minister. But we created one as a transition. For the last five years, we have had a prime minister and a president. If you look at our action plan, and I can give you the address, where you, the, the email, the, 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 the website address where you can uh, download it because it's uh, free to download. It's actually signed by both the president and the prime minister. The thinking was because you cannot say this side looks stronger, he's going to win or he's likely to win, and therefore you ignore the other side. You want ownership from both sides. Because we have seen from other, experiences, from other countries' experiences where they have leaned so much toward one side, and that by some bad coincidence, that side which they thought would win, loses. And uh, everything, no matter how good it is, no matter how helpful it can be for the country, goes under the it's thrown into the dustbin. We did not want to go that way. And therefore, we wanted to show that our stakeholders are stakeholders, whether they come from the opposition or they come from the government, because they are Kenyans like any other Kenyan. And that's what we have done. So we do not see the possibility. And again, now, the new government, after the, the elections now, the government actually has warmed up to the action plan. 
and uh, we have seen, and uh, again, I, I want to correct the impression that uh, it's in the future medium term plans. The current medium term plan that actually has taken effect from 1st of July this year, and it will go up to uh, end of June 2018, already is the one I was saying already has uh, climate change adaptation and mitigation mainstreamed. And therefore, already those are national, national initiatives. The, the Constitution, again, binds the political powers. They, they, they can only do small uh, shift here and there. They cannot just come and change a whole system that has gone through a full national stakeholder consultation process. And therefore, we think we have a, a very high degree that many of the initiatives will be, will, be, will, will, will be implemented. Number three, then, we also have the ownership from the, 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 the sectors. And that, you remember in my two slides, I started by talking about stakeholder involvement and a more sectoral or integrated approach. We went through to every, we talked with every sector working group in the different sectors of our economy. And therefore, they own those issues, the prioritization of the initiatives or the proposed actions. They are the ones who actually, we gave them the opportunity, we only facilitated. So that then, when we prioritize, then there is ownership from those stake, uh, the sector stakeholders so that then it does not look like it's Ministry of Environment which is imposing ideas or thinking on them. I think that one, I, I, I can leave it at that point. And then, um, uh, I think the question from our, our colleague, I don't know, uh, I didn't get the name. How we have taken, I'll, I'll leave the, the first part was a comment, that was a remark, and then I'll just comment about, uh, the, I'll give an example of how we have tried to address uh, vulnerable groups. And I'll not look at groups, I'll just look at 80% of Kenya is arid or semi-arid. And uh, from analysis, from uh, a lot of studies, that is the most fragile in terms of climate change uh, related shocks. Uh, that's the most fragile part of the country. And uh, what we have done, uh, I'll give you what, just one initiative. We already have an ending drought emergency uh, strategy integrated within the, uh, the, 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 within the action plan and now integrated within the medium term plan. Part of the plan is to actually to give them alternative uh, so, so, so sources of livelihood and also to give them alternative ways of, uh, of course, there is the part of uh, public awareness where, because most of them are livestock keepers, so that then they, they learn, they, 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 they start appreciating the need to cut down or to sell their livestock uh, early enough before they are emaciated, by, of course, by, by drought-related uh, impacts, so that then they, they lose most of their livelihood. That's one. Number two, we have actually tried to help them diversify their livelihood so that they don't just depend on livestock alone. And uh, it's, uh, the, 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 the water table in those areas, by some good, uh, good coincidence, is not very far from the surface. And therefore, what uh, many of the initiatives that are helping, that, that, that we have put in place, are to help them access that water so that they do irrigation. And already that is happening. If you go to some of the places, it's happening. Some of them, of course, we have learned from, uh, because part of the process was also learning from uh, good practices, of course, that have worked in some of the areas and the, uh, the, 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 the potential to replicate them in other areas with similar agroecological uh, zones. We have had a few projects, of course, in those areas, pilot projects, where irrigation has been tried and it has worked very well. The good thing is that it's actually a very hot area. And therefore, you find that uh, you plant today in three months, the crop is ready for harvest. I'm talking about maize because it's a step of food. And uh, that helps us because then you don't have to irrigate the whole year. We, only, we, we, we have to rain for seasons. And when the rain for season is not so good, they can irrigate their crops. Of course, it's not already so widespread, but we have targeted areas where we, of course, of, we, we, have, we, have, we have got those initiatives amongst many others. So we have thought seriously about vulnerable groups. And uh, we have involved them. We went to them. We had their ideas. We had what issues they were going through in relation to climate change. Then uh, lastly, there was the issue of, uh, uh, from our friend uh, uh, Richard from Uganda, uh, what we are doing to address uh, agriculture vis-a-vis -vis environmental degradation. Forest, uh, forest, forest. and environmental degradation, I'll just talk uh, very briefly. We looked, part of our baseline building process was also to look at uh, what policies exist in the different sectors that have got some aspects of uh, climate change, or oh, that would be contradictory 
or so that, that would contradict what we want to do or what we are proposing to do to address uh, climate change adaptation and mitigation. And uh, by some coincidence, we have, uh, I'll just refer to two documents. We have uh, our Kenya Constitution 2010 that we promulgated in 2010. It prescribes, it prescribes a minimum forest cover of 10% for the whole country. And every arm of the government, every sector of the economy must, of course, uh, show what they are doing or what measures they are putting in place to address that. It's part of addressing, of course, the uh, forest degradation. And why address forest degradation? It's uh, the forests are actually integrated with our water towers. So if we do not address the forest degradation, then we are going to lose all our water towers, and therefore Kenya will be a very uh, crazy area in terms of, uh, in terms of uh, water, water sufficiency. And uh, then in, in the agriculture sector itself, we have, uh, under the Agriculture Act, we have uh, farm forest rules that were launched in 2009. And that's part of it. We, we exploited that because already that was in place. The farm forest rules prescribe 10% forest, 10% uh, tree cover for every agricultural land. And therefore, it's something that we can, uh, we, we, because uh, my friend from Ghana talked about uh, synthesizing, or say finding a synthesis uh, between the different, uh, the, 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 the thinking or the approaches, of course, in the different sectors. And therefore, from a climate change perspective, we think we can work with the agriculture people to exploit already a policy that exists of the 10% tree cover for farmlands, so that then it, uh, it helps us to, of course, uh, and of course there will be other aspects, of course, uh, other policies from other different sectors that would be, uh, that needs to be synthesized, of course, with the, with the, with the farm forest uh, rules that uh, prescribe 10% tree cover for forest, uh, for, uh, for farmland, sorry. Great. Thank you, Thank you Stephen. Okay. Anyone else here up on the panel want to respond yeah, to any, any number of those? D Dalali, you look like you're, you're about ready, but Mishra, you have the mic in your hand. Why don't you jump in? Yeah. The question about the political parties uh, taking the agenda and uh, they doing a lot of, and in case of Kenya, in fact, in democracy, uh, some deviation is uh, always there. So whenever the change of guard takes place, that is driven by the political parties. But if you have drawn your plan uh, through the stakeholder consultations like the Kenya has done, and you have uh, kept everybody and all the key players involved, I don't feel any political party will have uh, that much courage to completely throw out that uh, plan. In, in, in case of our country, in India, we also adopt the five-year planning uh, for uh, different sectors. Uh, and uh, uh, elections take place in, in mid-course. I mean, uh, next year there will be election in India. But the Overall policy uh, kind of activities, they remain the same. The government, new government may come, they may uh, give it a new name, but the, all the activities will remain the same. So if you have a long persuasion based on the concrete facts and also with the involvement of stakeholders, it is very difficult to change uh, the policy. And another thing in, in case of India, because uh, almost 60% is dependent on agriculture, and that is a mass which governs, uh, which, uh, which is the, have the larger representation in the electorates. So it's very difficult to uh, deny the kind of uh, importance the agriculture has in the country. Dalali, any comment on that? Yeah, just a very quick one. Um, to our friend from um, Uganda. In the case of Ghana, the picture you have painted is very, very true. Um, the recent uh, greenhouse gas inventory that has been conducted in Ghana clearly shows that about 50% of the emissions are from the agriculture and forestry, forest interface. And as a single sector, agriculture is the leading emitter now in Ghana. And if you add land use, uh, land use and land use change factor, then it's getting to about 50%. And this is one of the major reasons why you cannot be only looking at the individual sectors. This is the reason why in planning for adaptation, you need to plan to integrate the activities. For example, between 2003 and 2005 in Ghana, we've had 
a hell lot of uh, increment in production of uh, cereals, let's see. But that was at the expense of forest cover. That was at the expense of forest cover. So the idea now is to see how to increase and sustain agricultural productivity with minimum or no impact on the existing forest cover. While the forestry, uh, uh, the forestry uh, sector is looking at rehabilitating and increasing the, uh, the existing forest cover. And for us to achieve that, there's a need for a close collaboration between these two sectors so that the, uh, uh, there will be a win-win situation. If we take it on individual uh, sector basis, then there will always be a conflict and therefore the need for planning. Uh, there were some hands up that we didn't get a chance to, to get some questions to right next to Osana there. Go ahead. Okay, for me, I'm Simon Yokabi. I'm Kenyan, but I'm actually studying in Germany. So my question is, goes to my friend also from Kenya because I wanted to ask, like, right now we are moving from a more centralized government to a more decentralized units and I think if you look then there is a conflict that some of these things or policies may be replicated and you have like dual or comp competing entities trying to implement the same. So how have these issues been factored into the whole implementation of climate change? And then the other one comes from like the diagram you had in your presentation like you have the Mwanainchi being on top but in reality, most of the time, you find people tend to think, as and I'm saying it as being a Kenyan also, like rarely do people rarely do people get to participate in the development of these policies and initiatives. And from what I know, a lot of projects have failed because people tend to think like these people are trying to impose something on us instead of like making us develop something that we think is good for us. And also like to add a point that you never put in your reply to when you are answering to my friend from Ghana was that Vision 20, that is part of our constitution and so it binds every government that comes into, into power and I guess this may be one reason that my friend was so much like nearly sure that some of these programs may succeed because it's part of the constitution and it binds everyone. Okay, thank you. Anything else from the floor? Okay. Uh, Stephen, why don't you have a stab at that one then for the moment? And then, um, again, we'd, we'd really want to set a, some time aside to share some other country experiences uh, in cross-sector planning. So um, I really encourage us during uh, the the answering of this next question to be thinking in that way and I hope that we can share some experiences then at, at that point. Okay, thank you. I, thank you Simon for that question and thank you for helping me answer our colleague from Ghana and uh, you, you said the truth. So uh, I think I would rather answer your question the other way. What are we doing to to ensure that climate change concerns or adaptation in, in our case, because that's what we are addressing today, is, uh, is, uh, is, uh, is um, integrated in county, county development plans or in county thinking. One, we have planned, I'll tell you, we went through a rigorous process. I don't know when, uh, when you last talked to your county governor or something. Went through a county process, a, a very rigorous uh, and very inclusive uh, process of consultations. Uh, we did not go out as government, we went out as a, a task force where we had uh, the government represented, we had uh, the CSOs represented, like I mentioned, two who represented local and the national uh, uh, NGOs, and uh, we had uh, the private sector represented in the task force. And therefore, when we went out, we said, and we had consultants, of course, and we said, we are not going out as uh, individuals or as individual institutions. We must go out as a national task force to address climate change. We went to all the counties, 
and we called, uh, we had meetings with the, the community people, the community leaders, we had local CSOs, we had every stakeholder category that you can imagine, or that you could imagine. Anyway, this process, you cannot be, you cannot say with certainty that it was uh, totally exhaustive because it's not possible anyway. So we went to all the counties, we got the issues from the counties themselves. I can share many examples, but I cannot because of time. I can share many examples of uh, how our thinking or wh what we thought would come out from the counties or from the communities changed uh, as we talked with the counties and they gave us their issues. And they told us the experiences with climate change, the understanding. Num num and, and, and then in, in this aspect, we also need to realize that uh, although we told our consultants that they need to listen to the stakeholders, we also gave them a heavier responsibility to, 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 to analyze, to come up with an, an analysis or with a, with a way of determining perception. Because sometimes when you listen to the community, sometimes it's a perception. When you do a scientific analysis, you might find actually what they are telling you is a signal of climate change that they have experienced. You might find actually there is no, no trend at all from the, that, the data and information that you have. So there are all those issues. There is the misconception that everybody is talking about climate change and blaming climate change for everything. There was a good case uh, or I, I, I read one time of Malawi where it looked like uh, the productivity of the agricultural sector went down from some years. And everybody was saying climate change, climate change. Only for somebody to realize actually that's when the structural adjustment programs were, were introduced and the government removed all the subsidies on the farm inputs. And therefore, the productivity went, went down, and everybody thought it's climate change. And therefore, we also need to delineate the, the reality from all those misconceptions, or, or let me not say misconception, from all those uh, perceptions. And uh, then, so after we collected our information, we sat down with the consultants, we analyzed the issues, and we proposed ways of addressing the issues. Of course, we synthesized and harmonized the issues, and we proposed ways of, uh, uh, of uh, addressing the issues. And at the end of the day, we went back at technical level, we did validation for every segment of the action plan. We did a, a validation. Just looking at the technical issues, the, the, the reality, where, the, where is the evidence, what are the issues, how do we address them, how do we propose to address them. And after that, now we went to a, we went to a higher level, a national stakeholder validation where we called, uh, we had two representatives from every county, every single county of the 47. And we said these two representatives must not be government workers. Why? Because we can get the government from Nairobi. That's where the ministers are, that's where the, the permanent secretaries are, that's where uh, the directors, many of the directors are, 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 are found, or can be found. Therefore, they can represent the government. Because there is no point of bringing gov a government officer from a county which is far-fetched to come and talk for the community. The communities can talk for themselves. So we asked for two representatives, and we said to, to take care of gender, one must be a lady, one must be a man. 47 counties, all of them were represented, including Nairobi. And we looked through the action plan. Of course, you cannot go through every item, uh, item by item, because then you are dealing with a, a large crowd one, and then there is, uh, of course, the, the, time, the, 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 the time constraint. And uh, in that validation workshop, the stakeholders proposed some areas to be, they said, no, no, this perhaps needs to be changed to A, B, C, like that. And we had to do it because we went through that process to get their thinking, to get their ideas, to get their experiences with climate change. So this is my assessment. I think there is a lot of stakeholder ownership addressing the issues as they affect the, the stakeholder. Because why did we go out then? You cannot go out to, 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 to sound stakeholders, then you come and start thinking the stakeholders did not say the right thing. You can only see, try to delineate what is reality from perception, but then you must address those issues as they affect the stakeholders. That's the, process, the purpose, ideally, of a, a stakeholder uh, consultation uh, process in a national adaptation planning process. I, 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 and therefore, according to me, Manainji still remains on, at the top. And we told them, what we are telling them at the grassroots level is that it is you, it is your issues, it is your county, it is your sub county or whatever. You can actually, we told them, because part of it is also to educate them on their rights. And we told them it is you to talk to your county governments and make sure that these things are addressed in the county government planning process. We helped from the top, now we, we address it from the bottom, bottom up, and then from the top, 
we prepared this because the county governments were not in place when we were doing that process. And therefore, what we prepared with the Minister of Planning are county uh, planning, draft county plans. We made sure that we have a chapter addressing climate change for each of the 30, 47 counties. So that by the time then they are adopted by the county government, the different county governments, at least there is some starting point that addresses climate change adaptation, climate change mitigation issues in that particular county. Now, every county, is, uh, every county assembly is in the process of producing a county integrated development plan. But what draft are they using? They are using the same draft at a certain point that we are, where we influence the inclusion of a climate change chapter. And we think that is the best that we could do because we could not produce a fully fledged county plan when the county governments were not in place. So this is, the, this is the process. And one of the advantages that I've been telling people we have is because these county governments are new, they are still thinking of the priorities to propagate all the, the what to, 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 to take on as the priorities. We think we have an opportunity to influence them some more so that then they address climate change with the seriousness that it deserves. Thank you. Thank you, Stephen. I'm, I'm wondering if we have in the audience any other country experiences that could be shared. Um, and it doesn't even necessarily have to be at the, at, at the country level. If there's some experiences that you've had within your own institutions, I think that there's a lot of development practitioners, there's a lot of uh, non-governmental organizations represented here. Um, these cross-sectoral challenges we face, not at, only at the government level, but within our own institutions. Uh, we continue to operate in, in silo structures. There's not uh, a lot of communication between various disciplines. Um, so uh, I guess I ask for experiences not only at the country level, but if you have something within your own institution where you've been able to facilitate that, uh, we'd be very interested to hear that. I, I should mention, um, I'm gonna, Andy's not going to like me for this, but Andy Jarvis has, has stepped in here. Um, and Andy, when you were gone, I used some of your words in your absence from this morning. Um, and I talked a little bit about climate smart agriculture and how when we came into this venture of, a few years ago, we were expecting, we were looking for trade-offs and we were expecting so many trade-offs in, in, uh, between adaptation and mitigation and development. Um, and I, and I use your same words this morning in saying that we've, there have been some difficulties in finding trade-offs and then what we've been finding is synergies. Um, and we've had an opportunity over the last few days uh, to engage in, in uh, engage with these stakeholders here uh, in our workshop. Um, I, what, what lessons do you think uh, regarding synergies most come to mind uh, based on those experiences and the, and the learning that we've had, the shared learning that we've had. Huh, okay, I'll get, I, I'll, I'll go, I'll get a bit politically provocative on it. So, we are finding it difficult to see trade-offs. A lot of these things are synergistic, but also, I think NAPS, the whole point of NAPS is moving towards a medium to a long-term vision, forwards. And um, I think maybe today with we have the argument about whether we should be held accountable to mitigate or not. Maybe, you know, that is still on the agenda now. But when you're looking over long time periods, 20 years, I think it's going to be very clear that everybody needs to move towards low carbon economies. And um, so why, while it's now a very politically sensitive issue, I think in the long term, there's, there's no getting around it. We need as a society, and this is not specifying any particular country, but as a society, uh, we need to explore um, the means of growth under uh, low carbon scenarios. And so, um, so I think, uh, for me, I think NAPs are a fantastic opportunity for being forward looking in setting the development space that you're moving towards to be um, synergistic. So you are adapting but you're also uh, looking for these opportunities, these co-benefits. And I think, I don't think it requires, um, well, at least from our evidence, it's not requiring massive amounts of trade-offs. The mitigation aspect is not an additionality in terms of cost that holds economic growth back. And so, 
you know, whilst in the negotiations you have to do NAPs and then some countries are thinking about NAMAs but it's not obligatory or, you know, whilst in the negotiations I think those two are, are at <coughs> least now and for a, a good many years to come going to be separate, I think in development strategies there is a fantastic opportunity to put those, th those two together. And so um, examples, I, I'll, I'll, I'll go Latin American. You have um, a number of countries in Latin America who are actually developing low emissions development strategies before they're doing um, adaptation plans. So Colombia, for example, has a low carbon development strategy now. You have Costa Rica who are now implementing a, a, a mitigation action in coffee. And so, um, so I, think, I, I think NAPS, in being cross-sectoral, should also be, be thinking about those co-benefits and those synergies. And, uh, and I, I, you know, I think we need to stop talking about trade-offs. I think, um, I th uh, at least from what we really find it difficult now to find trade-offs. It's, it's really synergistic, adaptation and mitigation, and it's linked to development. I wonder if there's any comment from the panel on, on Andy's statement, particularly your experiences with uh, integration of mit mitigation and adaptation and some of the forces that are pushing you in any of, uh, of those directions. Um, anything from the panel on that? Go ahead, yeah. Dalal. Uh, I think that the question um, our friend from Uganda asked actually brings this issue to perspective. Agriculture expanding into forest area, forest, uh, causing forest degradation. And how do we address that? We want to address that by limiting the expansion of the agricultural landscape into the forest area. If we are able to achieve that, it means that we are indirectly mitigating. But how are we going to do the agriculture in the agricultural landscape in such a way that the productivity does not dip? Because one reason why farmers continue ext extending into the forest la landscape is they are chasing fertility. They are chasing fertility. What do we do to the uh, existing agricultural landscape to enable the farmers continue to, pro, uh, to produce on sustainable basis without significantly reducing their productivity or even increasing their productivity. And that is where the issue of adaptation comes in. So in one breath, you are doing adaptation. In the other breath, the same uh, action that you are taking is contributing to what? Mitigation. So, through one action, you are uh, achieving two things. And that is where Ghana is looking at the low carbon growth, but without sacrificing socioeconomic development. Uh, any institutional stories from the audience at this point? If, if not, there's one thing that we haven't really dived into yet, which is engagement of the private sector in, in this whole debate. Um, and I think in a lot of the other side events and, and some of the events, the technical and networking sessions that we've seen over the last few days, uh, the private sector has really been at the center, center of discussion. Um, and I think that the NAP process, and this is coming out of our workshop as well, but I think that the NAP process offers um, some platforms for engagement with the private sector. Um, in, oftentimes we associate that with uh, a pathway towards sustainability of funding for NAPs. Um, so I'm wondering if the panelists can comment briefly on the role of the private sector in developing their NAP, um, because I, I think that the private sector and the government is, uh, is really still trying to understand how they're interacting with a landscape approach. Um, and so uh, some examples of private sector engagement. And can I, can go I ahead. Take this off? Mm -hmm. um, simply because, you know, having looked at 12 different countries and their approaches here and, and um, stakeholder engagement and how the private sector is engaged, what is notable um, is that the private sector is often lacking. And yet at the same time, countries identify um, huge financing needs. 
And implementation oftentimes involves private sector, uh, you know, small scale landholders to large agribusiness to forestry country, com different different scale companies, um, you know, the the whole infrastructure aspect. Um, you know, when you look at where the costs are going to rest and what sort of finance decisions will be made in the future, um, private sector actors are really important. So, um, you know, one of the most important things that I think we have to encourage governments to do here in their NAP process is to look at the private sector actors that need to be engaged um, bring them into the planning process, into the vulnerability and risk assessment process as early as you possibly can, because that's where private sector actors will understand what their risks are. And a lot of private sector actors don't understand those risks, aren't doing the sort of planning to really understand what the long-term risks are. So that's the first point to engage. And then the other is, um, Really, again, in thinking about you know your question actually about finance, um, you know, and and um, when you look at climate finance and you look at the you know the the sort of adaptation stream and what that looks like right now, and these are you know they're very conceptual, um, you know, they're, they're, it's just a very conceptual sense of what that stream is right now and what it can be looking um, five years out or or ten years out. Um, the role of, of the private sector in that stream is actually huge. Um, and so we need, to, um, we need to really figure out how private sector actors in you know, the LDCF and the different funding sources that we currently have, how those funds can specifically leverage private sector finance. So I'll leave it there for our country points of view. I think briefly, briefly I think uh, one chase I think we need to, to know what is the definition of private sector here because uh, let me tell you, I, I, I think uh, this is my, this my, this my opinion. I think many of those uh, pieces of literature that uh, allude to the fact that the private sector is not interested in uh, adaptation should be rewritten. One, we are talking about farmers. Are some of the farmers not private sector, the large-scale farmers, they are doing it as a, commerce, as a commercial enterprise. And we cannot say we are not addressing, when we are talking about farmers, we are not picking only the small-scale farmers and leaving out the private sector, uh, leaving out the commercial farmers. Two, I think uh, even in terms of uh, generating information that will actually inform our baseline, many of the large-scale farmers, especially in Kenya, already have a fully-fledged uh, weather and climate, uh, climate stations where they collect rainfall, they collect temperature and all that. And they, they actually are part of, uh, and part of this system. And then thirdly, many of the private sector actors are already actually contributing to adaptation initiatives through, even, even if it's just through the cooperative, uh, cooperative social, social, so, so, social, uh, social, social social respons uh, responsibility, the, the C CSR. And I, I, I think so. I, I think we need uh, we, we, we need perhaps to, 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 to start thinking broadly as we think about the private sector. Then, from the Kenyan experience, we 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 had two levels, of course, of uh, involvement. Perhaps three levels, because even when we went to the to the, to the to the local communities, the private sector was there. And in many cases, some of them would introduce themselves. They say, you know, I'm so and so. I'm doing agri business or something. Because again, the private sector are the suppliers of the farm inputs. And therefore we cannot, when we are addressing uh, adaptation along the whole uh, value chain of the agriculture production systems, we cannot say the private sector is out. But then, that said, uh, the, 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 that said uh, let me give you, uh, tell you the, the two levels, how the, the, higher, uh, uh, the other two levels where we involved in the private sector. We had the, I talked about the National uh, Task Force for Climate Change uh, uh, Action Plan process. We actually had the CEO of the Kenya uh, Private Sector Alliance sitting in that task force. And whenever we wanted, uh, at the lower level, uh, uh, slightly lower, we had uh, thematic working groups working on different uh, thematic areas of the Climate Change Action Plan. And again, we would write to the private sector, although 
the CEO was a member of our, of, our, of our task force. Then we would write to them officially. We say we need a private sector representative in this, uh, in this thematic working group. Uh, so that then, and uh, I'll give you one example because then this also touches on finance. We had actually the CEO of the Kenya Bankers Association chairing the finance thematic working group for the Climate Change Action Plan. And we think this is good inclusiveness. And I remember one of the remarks he made when he came for the very first few meetings and said, while other private sector uh, players might be seeing a challenge in climate change, is this a, 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 an investment opportunity in the very near future? And I, I was very encouraged. These were the words of us, the CEO of the Kenya Bankers Association. So that, and, and then I'll give you some of, just an example of some of the, some of the proposals that we have, uh, have, have, have already been integrated in our medium-term plan to address uh, farmers' resilience. We have uh, talked of the government putting in place initiatives to revive some of the farmers' cooperatives that have died because, because they, then they, it will give them bargaining power. When they have numbers, then they can arrange their own supply uh, 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 arrangements, at least even if it's importing, importing farm inputs or buying in bulk so that then the prices come down because then they'll, they'll not be, it's not like one farmer just going to buy one farm, a farm implement or something like that. And uh, so, so these are some of the issues. And then also uh, making sure, I, talk, I alluded to the, to the issue of uh, uh, reviving some of the dying uh, water dams so that then the farming communities can have, and some of these of course are initiatives that are going to be implemented by the, the, the private sector definitely. And they are also going to, uh, to, 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 to benefit the private sector, of course, indirectly, of course, through, because they are, they, 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 they will be the suppliers of many of, uh, of, uh, of, uh, of, the, of, uh, of the inputs, like I've said. But then perhaps uh, that's enough so that I, have, I leave the chance to others to, to speak their experiences. <coughs> yeah, from the Ghanaian perspective, I will say that um, the role of the private sector has been recognized especially during the preparation of the National Climate Change Policy. But the level of influence has rather been low. And um, I think that going forward, it is something that must be critically looked at because already there are indications on the ground that some of them on their own are undertaking activities that can feed into the implementation of this policy. For example, a private sector, a big um, fertilizer distribution company on its own has gone to do uh, a special uh, survey to identify areas for uh, construction of um, water storage facilities to support farmers to uh, do off-season uh, agriculture to serve as an outlet for the sale of their uh, uh, inputs. So such a thing, for me, is a very good uh, area that could be looked at uh, going into the future. In case of uh, our country in India, uh, there is a uh, body of uh, industries, that is Federation of Industries of Chamber of Commerce in India, and uh, they are representative at national level as well as they, they are represented at the state levels also. They are the part of the, the, these uh, climate change committees, wherever it is. The another thing, uh, what a, a major initiative during uh, this plan period we have taken up is that uh, we are now supporting the custom hiring hubs for the climate smart Im uh, farm implements. And they are operated invariably by the private, private partners, with the lead uh, banks in in the in the uh, rope. The third thing, as uh, uh, Stephen told, there are number of large farmers, and they are uh, they are doing uh, the kind of business which is uh, as good as a small entrepreneur in in a town or a county. So they are. Uh, very much part of the stakeholder consultations and other things. So, I mean, the scale may vary, but uh, the private is uh, uh, already uh, involved in the, all these consultations of the adaptation process. Right. I'm getting the, uh, the card outside that we have just a few moments left. 
Uh, I wanted to give the panel uh, 30 seconds each and, and a, a true 30 seconds each uh, to go through and give their key takeaway message, I think. Um, it's been a, a marathon session, so I, I'm happy to see everyone who's stuck around for the, for the majority of the talk. Um, Gabby, I'd love for you to start us. Uh, 30 seconds, set the tone, key messages, take away at the nexus of, uh, NAP nexus of, of agriculture, food security, water, and energy. Mm. It's difficult to do. Um, so I have to say, again, um, really just what we've heard here um, is that NAPs offer a really important tool to, um, when we think about medium to long-term adaptation planning, um, to really think about how mainstreaming occurs. What are some of the tangible ways in which some of these synergies um, can really be um, not only assessed, but put into, you know, pra uh, like pra practice, funded, um, made real, how to bring in different stakeholders. Some very different models um, here for how to do it, different governance structures. Um, every, every country will have their own approach here, but um, there's a lot to learn from. And thank all of you for coming. Uh, I think I'll start with a simple message that uh, all of us can attest to the fact that uh, climate change is real and it's already impacting in different ways, of course, upon our farming communities amongst other sectors. And therefore, we need to put in, in place uh, mechanisms or proposals to address uh, the suffering of the people and uh, looking, of course, uh, knowing that, of course, that we are addressing like a moving target because then you are not just addressing the variability today, you're also addressing the, 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 the potential uh, shifts in those variabilities, of course, in the coming years, uh, uh, of course, uh, as an impact of climate change. Then as we put these uh, this, uh, this mechanisms in place, or as we propose good ways to address uh, the climate change-related uh, issues, we need to pause and ask ourselves whether we are really addressing the area where the shoe pinches, so to speak, because uh, the, it, in English we say it's the where who knows where the shoe, the shoe pinches. And if we are not going to listen to our communities, our stakeholders, we are going to pre prescribe solutions that we think are very good from uh, our desktops. But then they are not actually going to be addressing the real issues on the ground. And that's the most, uh, I, I imagine that's the most important consideration as we make national adaptation plans. Thank you. Yeah, um, I will just want to say that we must remember that uh, every engagement that we undertake or plan to undertake will take place within or takes place within a landscape. And within that landscape are other competing engagements. Therefore, in planning for our activity or engagement, we must take into consideration the other engagements to ensure that we create a win-win situation within that landscape. Thank you. These announcements usually come in twos, but uh, try to sneak it in in between. Yeah. Uh, I, uh, <laughs> <laughs> Ladies and gentlemen, after long break, we will proceed for the closing plenary session at the Adam Skate Hall Auditorium Maximum, which will start at 6 p.m. There will be a closing remark that will be delivered in Polish, hence we will provide translation headsets in front of the plenary hall upon showing your participant badges. After the closing session, there will be a comfortable reception at the Vista Mama Hall, located in the new library building. Our support staff will help guide all participants to the Vista Mama Hall and will be awaiting in front of the Auditorium Maximum building. Okay, Mishra, you have now the final word. Uh, the NAPS has, a very unique, uh, has provided a very unique platform. Thank you.
Okay, there can't possibly be a, a fourth. So go ahead. I will say that the NAP has given a very unique platform, and uh, the bin bin situation will only be when uh, these are uh, the adaptation plans are mainstream in the development plans. We have taken an initiative in India, but uh, I have also learned a lot of things uh, from uh, Ghana, where they are doing the AFCON and the, the kind of activity. That's a really uh, how to involve all these stakeholders and uh, uh, go for a plan and implementation for the management of the resources of the commons. That would be the lead uh, thing that I'm getting. I want to give a, a final thanks, and if we can have a quick round of applause for the panelists here as well, that'd be great. <laughs> Just uh, one last reminder that we do have uh, some flash drives up here with the, the publications on them. We, again, we don't have any hard copies of the National Adaptation Plan Metasynthesis, but please grab one of these uh, discs on your way out. Thank you again. Uh, I have, um, <laughs> you're going to hear this a fourth time from me. <laughs> Ladies and gentlemen, after coffee break, we will proceed to the closing plenary session at the, at the uh, Mekowitz Hall, the major hall. Uh, in this building, which will start at 6 p.m., please take your coffee and tea from the catering stations outside of the auditori auditorium maximum so that you can proceed directly to the closing plenary room. There will be a closing remark that will be delivered in Polish. We've heard this four times. <laughs> okay. Uh, and then there's a cocktail reception uh, outside after the closing session, and the support staff will help you get there.